May my words be true to the written word, and the written word lead us to the living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please sit. There's a little box down here, which is probably for Lydia. <laughs> but as she's in the land of the giants today, it, I don't need it. In my house, I have two large bookcases, and uh, in preparation to decorate, I needed to empty them to be able to move them. It was one of those moments when the job in hand gets forgotten as I flicked through some books that I had forgotten about. Work stopped when I opened a copy of John Wyndham's book, The Chrysalids. It was, when it was published in 1955, polemic, along with Huxley's Brave New World. Its original title was Time for Change, and is a story of a God-fearing fundamentalist sect that sees anything or anyone that does not conform to their recognized norm as blasphemous and must be banished or killed. It's a story about our dislike of difference, change, and bigotry. It's a message for us today as we reflect on the passage from Luke's Gospel. Jesus has returned to Nazareth, the town he'd grown up in, the village seems to have been held in some contempt in the first century Palestine, a nondescript dot on the map with not much to offer, overshadowed by the nearby Sephoris, the luxurious Greek-style capital built by Herod Antipas. Nazareth, I doubt, could boast many celebrities among its population. So when Jesus, now a charismatic and famous teacher, returned home, he was at first warmly greeted. He had left Nazareth as a private person, and now he returned as a rabbi, accompanied by scholars and disciples. He went to the tiny synagogue and indicated that he wanted to read. And the expectation would be that after reading, he would teach, a bit like today. The gospel is read and the preacher teaches. The scripture passage he read was Isaiah 61, 1 to 2. And this is what Luke has, has as his words which are not so much a direct reading, but a paraphrase of the, for, for his teaching purposes. The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the oppressed. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Having read through the passage, Jesus, in the shortest sermon ever, spoke on what the words meant and how they had been fulfilled in him. The points he made were, first, that Isaiah's prophecy was now finally coming true. The second, that the one anointed with the Spirit was himself. And the third, the time of God's salvation had arrived. One, two, three, bang. Didn't go down well. What started well ends up with them wanting to run him out of the town. Why? His message doesn't conform to tradition. It's blasphemous. 
and like the protagonist in Wyndham's book, must be rejected, banished or killed. Jesus' life is full of rejection. There is rejection at the Samaritan village, rejection of his message at Bethsaida and Decapolis, rejection from birth by the Pharisees and scribes. Luke's theme, starting with the birth story, is to bring out the identity of Jesus as the Messiah, divine from birth and being the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Luke shows us what kind of Messiah Jesus will be and the character of his ministry, bringing in the new covenant, the kingdom of God that is focused and inclusive, based on justice, mercy, and truth. It's the start of a new era. You remember from the birth stories, the birth also of John, the, 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 the Baptist. He also was a child of God's mercy to Elizabeth and Zachariah. And he was to be named John, meaning God's mercy. John, the forerunner, marks the end of tradition. And he points the way to a new breaking in of God, a way that will be more uncomfortable but better, bringing in the year of the Lord's favor, a jubilee year, when debts are written off, old scores are forgotten and forgiven. Lance Armstrong, the disgraced cyclist, famously said, a boo is a lot louder than a cheer. And I'm sure Tony Blair and Boris Johnson would confirm that. <laughs> Armstrong hits the nail on the head because no one wants to be rejected. It's human, very human, to desire the approval of your peers. We start at an early age in seeking such approval. We want our parents to approve of us, our teachers in school to approve of us. We want our employers to approve of us. We want our fellow church members to approve of us. And most of all, we want the vicar to approve of us. We want our family and friends to approve of us, and this is all very normal. But while seeking their approval, we sometimes overlook the greatest need for God himself to approve of us. Because if God approves of us, no one else's approval really matters. Rejection is Satan's most used tool. Rejection comes in various forms. A physical flaw, like that of Sophie in Wyndham's book, who has six toes on one foot. You may have an emotional hurt, the death of a loved one, a divorce, or even an experience that has stayed on your mind for years. But again, if you seek God's favor, living the kind of life he created you to live, you can overcome everything else. Why? Because we, like Jesus, are also God's beloved sons. You have to believe that. You must believe that. We are also anointed to proclaim freedom and to proclaim God's good news. Because as St. Paul said in the reading from Corinthians, we are all baptized into one body and we all drink, made to drink of one spirit. 
there is a saying, the church does not have a mission, but the mission has a church. Jesus has given us his spirit and we too share in his mission. All who are Christians have been filled with the spirit and we are sent to share the good news in, in word and deed to bring justice and freedom and liberty, to reach out with acts of love and grace, to pass on what we have received from Jesus so that others can share in the celebration. So it's appropriate and right, since we share in Christ and his spirit, to declare that the spirit of the Lord is on you. That you have been anointed to bring others to the good news. It's not easy. Discipleship is not easy. It's not always comfortable. And you will feel rejection. Non-compliance and conformity with worldly ways, its politics, its economics, its social structure will bring the same response for those in Wyndham's novel, perhaps not killed, but rejected. I watched the film Don't Look Up on Boxing Day. It's about the Earth's impending doom from a comet impacting and destroying our world. No one will believe the scientists, so they are told, don't look up. Ignore it. That's what the world does to the good news of God's gift to the world. We don't look up and give praise and joy for the jubilee he offers us. We as Christians are often lacking when we should be pointing to what Jesus' birth, birth brings to us. Instead of following the star like the wise men and kneeling with the only offering we have, our hearts we shrink from proclaiming him. St. John says in his prologue, there was a light shining in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. We are in the season of epiphany, that manifestation of Christ to the world as represented by the Magi that moment of revelation or realization of God with, with us, God for us, and God in us. As God's sons, we are never rejected, and the Holy Spirit is upon us and working among us to enable us to share our joy of the fact that in our lives and with each other, so look up. Does the gospel in Jesus Christ fill you with, with some, so much joy that you want to share it? Or does it fill you with fear that keeps you clinging to tradition and the known? Instead of a New Year's resolution challenge yourself to think how will you live out the Spirit's presence in your life this year? Could we together make an impact on our community, on our workplaces? The Lord has given us all we need, his own self. Let us step up as we are led by the Spirit to demonstrate his love and joy and to share the good news for his praise and glory.
put the little stool back now.